questions. So I will start to thank all the people involved in the Beamline, uh, especially the Beamline team. So Roland, uh, who is uh, our assistant engineer, Aurea, who is a scientist in charge of the current scattering station, Alessandro, uh, Nicola, who is in charge of the rakes and station, and uh, for sure the real people that are working with uh, Eric and uh, Cyril, who are uh, postdoc, who are postdoc and a PhD student at the Beamline. And uh, something really important and maybe special we have at Tole is that we have uh, what we call the research associate and at the Beamline we have uh, quite a lot of them that are somehow involved in the Beamline operation and Beamline development. And in particular, so Andrew Bayan and Emmanuel, uh, Jean from the LCPM in Paris, Jean-Marc and Jerome from NCNL and Maurizio from uh, UNSP in Paris and a new member, which is Luke Ortega, that is uh, at the LPS uh, laboratory in Philippe de Solis in, in, in Saclay. So the outline of my talk, I will really briefly introduce resonant elastic isoscatting. scattering. I think everybody knows what we are speaking, but I will just introduce the mighty, the mighty cross section. Then I will also briefly introduce Soleil and, uh, and the beam line, and then I will move to the two part of my talk. The first one is not linked to crayons, uh, but it's simply resin scattering and how we can prove magnetic clarity in, in thin film, and uh, we can do it uh, at ultra fast time scale. And then I will move to holography and tichrography at the beam line, what we are doing now and what we want to do in the future, and this will be a link with the, with the first part. And then from perspective for, for, for future. So for the, the current scat, I mean the elastic scattering cross section, uh, this is a well known since a paper, a famous paper in the early, I mean in 88 from Anon and co-workers, that if you only consider the dipolar transition and you expand the you write the Newtonian racing, so you can write the resonance scattering cross section in three terms. The first term is a so-called uh, resonance, I mean, Thomson plus the resonance charge scattering term, which is the one that most people use in the RDX range. And there is two other terms that are proportional to M, which is the magnetic moment uh, when, when you uh, are at the L edge, for example, of the 3D metals. And these two terms, are the first term is proportional to M, and he has a dependence in polarization uh, when you have an incoming and outgoing polarization. And the second term is proportional to m squared from our auto. So it uh, can give information on anti magnetic compound. And it has also a different uh, polarization uh, dependence. And why it's interesting to do this in the third x ray range, despite that we, we have a quite limited uh, Eval sphere. Uh, but it's because uh, you can probe uh, the L edge of 3D metals on the edge of rubbers, which are the magnetic atoms. And uh, when you sit at resonance, you have an element and site and valence specificity. It's easy in the South X ray range to produce uh, polarized X rays. And uh, using circular polarized X rays, you can uh, probe the magnetic orbital and spin uh, contribution, and you can resolve the let's say, structure. The South X ray range is perfectly suitable because you have a huge sensitivity to, let's say, monolayer or very thin, uh, thin materials down to one nanometers. And the, the wavelength is in the range of one nanometers. And then if you add the current radiation, that the most important part for today is that you can recover the image of your sample and you can do it time resolve uh, depending on the source uh, you are using. That will be the all first things. Now I will just briefly introduce Soleil. So the Soleil uh, synchrotron is a French national facility, which is cover a wide energy range from the terrace up to, let's say, called very hard X-ray range, which because we are uh, one terrace beam line, and then we have a beam line that go down for a few, few tens of kilo electron volt. And you can see that if you look at the beam line as a function of energy, and we have and let's say, let's say roughly 50% of the beam line in the soft, in the so-called soft X-ray range and 50% uh, of them in the hard X-ray range with some uh, particular beam line like the Lucia or Sirius that are uh, focused on the tender X-ray X -ray range. Uh, since uh, 2015, uh, we reached the, the goal that was uh, to store 500 milliamps in the, in the storage ring. And to have, I don't remember, now we have 29 beamline in operation. 
And that's one of the highest current uh, for last generation machine. And then uh, since we let's say, reached the original goal of the, of the of the machine, now we, since that time, we start for a possible discussion for an upgrade and particularly to do like max for uh, uh, diffraction limited storage. That's something is still ongoing because we are quite slow in France <laughs> in the process. And uh, regarding the beam line, so it's a soft X-ray beam line. Uh, we cover wide energy run from 50 electron volts, so very soft, up to 1.7 kilo electron volts. With, we try to maximize the flux and to have on paper above 510 to the 12 photon per second with the 10,000 resolving power. And we use two ondulators as a source because the idea was to maximize the flux and the purity of the polarization in a small spot. So we only use uh, the first harmonic of the undulator for doing this. Uh, in terms of real flux, we have not in, on paper that the uh, beamline flux measurement at the sample and the rigs and station, which is a more demanding uh, experiment for flux. And basically, up to one kilo electron volt, you can see that we are in excess of 10 to the 12 photon per second, and then at higher energy, the flux go down uh, quite seriously. In terms of uh, coherence, uh, wait, yeah, okay. in terms of coherence, that the measurement we done uh, using a, a theory of all drill in uh, using uh, focus ion beam in a, in a opaque uh, membrane, and uh, we make it in a way that they are non redundant. And then if you take uh, this kind of uh, sample and you you make just a Fourier transform of the of the subject, you have this. Uh, hologram, and then uh, if you make a Fourier transform back, you should recover something like this. Now, if you put this sample on a real beam line with the full acceptance of the beam line, this is a, the scattering pattern we, we, we measure, and you see it somehow look like uh, the, the theoretical one. And if we do a Fourier transform back, you see that we recover a lot of point in the vertical direction because the source of Soleil is quite narrow in the vertical direction, but you can see clearly that in the horizontal direction, uh, we, we don't have a lot of this uh, diffraction spot, uh, indicating that the coherence length in the horizontal direction is really uh, worse than in the vertical direction. And if we repeat the same uh, by uh, reducing the acceptance of the beam line at the expense of uh, a two order of magnitude in photon flux, uh, you see that we improve quite a lot in the scattering pattern. And then uh, if you do the Fourier transform back, you see that uh, we, we have a current length that uh, is, we estimate around 25, around 35 micrometers in both directions. But this is a, we have to, a price to pay, and then we come back at the end uh, on, on, this, on, this, on this part. So now the main first part uh, is to, that's, Study that we start a few years ago, and uh, there is something in uh, and, uh, to probe magnetic reality in SINFIM, and this uh, collaboration between my, the beam line at Soleil and uh, and a group of uh, Vincent Cross and Nicolas Rennes uh, at uh, CNRS Thales. And uh, I put in white the real people uh, that worked that was Jean Yves who was a chair postdoc, uh, William was a PhD, Eric was also a chair postdoc, and Cyril. Uh, this is a shared student on Yanis and Mathieu that just started his PhD uh, a few months ago. And then we have also to analyze uh, the fund uh, <laughs> to, to do this work. So uh, maybe most of you are not familiar with the magnetic uh, magnetism. So I will just briefly try to work up to, to recall uh, what are the terms. And if you look at the magnetic system, you have several magnetic interaction uh, that you have to account. The first one and the most important one is the so-called exchange energy. And this uh, um, ex ex energy term can be right in this kind of form. And you see from the simple mathematics that in fact, this term for the magnetic, the spin to be parallel and to be, I mean, so to have a ferromagnetic alignment. You have uh, also a dipolar interaction, which is uh, an expression at this point. And then this dipolar interaction is somehow the field that expands from the atom, and you have to close the field uh, as usual in a magnet. And this induces that this um, neighboring magnetic moment want to be uh, anti-parallel. And in fact, in a real system, uh, in a demagnetic state, you have a competition between these two terms, and this leads to uh, 
the creation of uh, magnetic domains and the size of the magnetic domains is directly related to the term of, I mean, the competition of these two, these two terms in the, in the system. And then if you have, uh, you add, uh, you look a bit, I mean, smaller energy term, uh, you have the interface and isotropy term, which is something that has been discovered a long time ago, that when you send down the system, like, uh, for example, you take a cobalt uh, layer, and when you send on the system, you, you move from a, from a in-plane uh, for thick cobalt layer to out-of-plane uh, anisotropy, and then you, you spin, uh, move out-of-plane of the same thing. And the last term, it's a... Uh, Existing in, in the Berg, this uh, Jarisky Moria interaction, and uh, a work from uh, Albert uh, a few years ago showed that, in fact, when you, you couple two, magnetic, two materials, like a magnetic uh, thin layer to a large spin orbit coping material, like a platinum, tungsten, or radium, you, you create at the interface between these two uh, layers an equivalent of a, a jarosky moria interaction term. It's a, now it's called nowadays uh, interfacial jarosky moria interaction. But that's the the, the 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 way you express this term is, is the same. And you look from the mathematics that uh, this term wants that the spin start to bend, and then you have a, a bending of the spin neighboring spin around a so-called uh, jarosky moria vector. And that's because uh, that is the source of the chirality in, in, in such a materials. So if you increase this uh, GMI term, in fact, you, I mean, if you have no GMI term in the system, you have a, what is called the domain walls are this block type. And those, if you move from, from out of plane, a magnetic moment to, I mean, upwards and downwards, you, you have somehow to, to move from this part to this one in the, in the two domain, and you have the so-called domain wall. And in most of the bulk system, on most of six uh, film, you have a block type domain walls that you magnetization rotate uh, in the direction that you have a domain wall, which is somehow the spin rotate and make a rotation in plane uh, in this direction. If you increase this uh, DMI term, you move to a nail wall, which are much less natural in nature, uh, that you rotate with a, a uh, a winding which is uh, you rotate in this direction directly. Uh, so you see that you have a, a, a what sense of rotation which is orthogonal, and then if you increase increase it even uh, bigger, so that your DMI term start to be a uh, dominant term or one of the most dominant term, you you end up with no 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 more domain, but with a perfect spin spiral in the system. That's something you can create uh, in artificially in in synthetic. So just to briefly show you uh, and why this is important. I mean, because this, uh, when you have this kind of system, when you, you, have, you have this kind of nail tab domain wall, you can stabilize by just applying external field, uh, uh, transform the domain wall, which is a 1D object to a 2D object, which is so-called uh, skirmions. And that's a potential for, let's say, application. And uh, but there is because you can move it and you can store information very, very in a very small, uh, uh, I mean, surface. And you have also you can uh, engineering this and make spin orbital on your domain. And that's a really uh, something that in, in, in spin tronic, uh, a lot of laboratory are, are working nowadays. But then you need to, to understand the study this, you need to access to the full uh, magnetic distribution and in particular the distribution of the magnetization at the domain walls. And that's something we study uh, in, in our system. So as I say, we, we typically grow a multi-layer on the side. So we stack a magnetic layer very thin. It's typically 0.8 nanometers and we put a spin orbit coupling uh, material, I mean, uh, material with high spin orbit coupling like platinum and iridium and we divert it choose to, to, to not have the same at the twin of I mean, the twin of the cobalt layer. And then when you grow that, but you can uh, have magnetic domains as in a DMAX state, like a maze domain, or you can, if you DMAX the system with the in-plane magnetic field, you, you can create uh, perfectly a great a grating of magnetic domains. And that is uh, depending. And that is something uh, now we are looking, and what we do in our case, we come from from uh, we take soft X-ray uh, uh, X-rays, 
and we we take the put the wavelength at the cobalt L3 edge, and we just send the light on the sample, and we look at, at the specular, I mean the scattering intensity using a 2D detectors. And basically, uh, if you take a, a I mean uh, like a maze domain uh, system, uh, it's like a border; it's completely disordered. But you have a coherence uh, lens. You have a typical lens, and that gives you a, a ring of scattering intensity, like in polar diffraction. And if you reverse the left and right incoming polarization, you see that you have a strange change in the distribution along the, the ring, uh, intensity distribution along the ring. And if you do the difference between these two, you can see that you have a, a, a huge difference and what we call a circular dichroism in, in scattering intensity. And in that case, uh, as you can see, it's a, a, a French flag. So you can also do the same uh, with the stripy domain. So you don't have any more ring. You have a bright, uh, bright spot, but uh, like here, and you have the first order, the third order, and everything. But the, the idea remains the same, but you see a nice uh, dichroism. And I will try to show you uh, that this dichroism is directly related to the, to the domain wall uh, chirality. So if you take a, an, an azimuthal angle of this of this dom, I mean this diaprism and you, you plot this as a function of the azimuthal angle, you see that you have a like a almost a sine function. And if you, you take the paper from Anon and you, you calculate uh, the scattering intensity uh, and in the Born approximation uh, to make it simple, and you try to modelize uh, what is an AL domain wall. So as I show you, you you up uh, from up to down domain and you have to move in this direction and you can simply make a, a modelization of this domain wall by a cycloid and winding because as you know in diffraction we it's very easy to calculate this cosine and sine function and if you do the simulation just like uh, you obtain this if you take a clockwise nail wall uh, you have this kind of simulation if you take a clockwise block domain walls, the one which uh, the block is uh, on that direction, you see that we have a phase shift of 90 degrees. So it's basically uh, just by a simple comparison that uh, in your experiment, we can directly claim that we have an AL type domain wall in the system and it's uh, clockwise. Uh, its winding sense is clockwise. If this is because we have uh, iridium at the bottom and platinum at the top, if we reverse, uh, the sense, I mean, that you can do the simulation for the opposite. If we reverse the stacking in your, in your system and we start with the platinum before putting the cobalt and right on the top, you see that experimentally we reverse the sign of the dichroism, which means that in that sense, by just changing the, in fact, changing the ordering of your growth, you change the sign of the DMI interaction. And so you revert uh, the sense of rotation of, of your domain walls. And that is directly uh, seen in a, in a scattering experiment. So that's the first results. Uh, but now, I, just to show you that if you do it for a times five uh, multilayer, that's it's perfectly reproducible. You reverse the DMI interaction, you reverse the dark rhythm. You do it for times ten, ten repetition, it's the same. And then you increase the repetition; it's not working anymore. And that was a, a big surprise for us. And unfortunately, we start with this system. So uh, we spend uh, quite a lot of time to understand what happened. And this is very surprising. In fact, what uh, we realized that what happened is that if you make micrometric simulation on the system, for a times a five repetition period, you see that you have a cycling in rotation, which is constant in the five cobalt layer. If you do it for times 10, uh, it's almost the same. But you see that at the top, something happened. And then if you do it for the 20 repetition, you see that you have a sense of rotation at the bottom. You arrive at some point that you have a, the spin in the domain walls are uh, pointing orthogonal to the one here, and then it rotates in the other sense. That in fact, what we call it is due, it's simply due uh, because you have a, when, when you, yeah, and, and as you we use soft X-rays, we mainly prop the top, which means that uh, we always have this, uh, independently of the stacking layer. And it's because, in fact, when you start to have a sample which is thick enough, the dipolar fields start to be, uh, start to play a role, and you need to close uh, the, the field. And this induces uh, what's something what we call uh, uh, an hybrid domain walls. 
And uh, in fact, we have an hybrid charity with one charity on the top, uh, the opposite uh, at the bottom. And uh, in the middle, we have a block uh, type domain wall. And that's something what's completely unknown and unexpected at the end. And that's something that uh, we discover using Celtic with scattering. And then, and then I don't spend too much time, but that's something you can control by uh, applying in plane field along the block part. You can move and expand or vanish the block part. So somehow you can externally control the, the clarity or the type of clarity of your system uh, just by applying an extension. But I have no time today to, to show you this. And then I said, you can do it time resolve. And that's something we do. So recent, more recently, we, we take a sample and then we go to a free ton laser and okay, the, the Fermi uh, free ton laser in Trieste. And uh, you repeat exactly the same experiment. You, you use uh, X-rays uh, on the sample and you measure the scattering intensity and you pump with an infrared laser. In this case, uh, the X-rays uh, that we are looking at the uh, a funny edge, uh, it's a cobalt M23 edge. It's not a very high resonance. Uh, I mean, it's, it's quite a smooth edge, but you can recover exactly the same information that you have a, a magnetic ring. And then if you do the difference between left and right position, you have a, a dark reason. If you do that as a function of time, uh, you, you demag the same. So if we look at the uh, intensity of the magnetic ring, uh, when you start to pound the system at T equal zero, you demag the system and then you, the magnetic intensity, scattering intensity uh, uh, vanish a lot and recover. If you do it at the longer time scale, so you de-zoom and you do it up to uh, 900 picosecond, you see that in fact the blue curve, which is a dichroism, recover faster than the thumb, which is the magnetic moment, let's say the magnetic scattering intensity. It's basically this shows that uh, the domain will magnetization recover much faster than the main domain magnetization in the main domain. And that's something we, we measure perfectly, but that's something has been also measured and published before us by uh, the group of uh, Christian Gut in Zingen and uh, Matthias Klaur in, in Mainz. But we just confirm uh, the same experiment. And in our case, we, we focus uh, on the ultra fast time scale. And now if we plot the asymmetry ratio, uh, well, so we divide the difference between the sum uh, in magnetic scattering intensity and we plot it as a function of time. We have these white and black dots and we in the paper we have a, a third experiment. So we repeat several times the experiment to, to be sure. And you see that uh, the asymmetry ratio is one, uh, let's say, which is normalized before the pumping and start to deviate from one at the in the first two picosecond and recover around one uh, at the uh, let's say at five picoseconds. Another idea was to explain this deviation. And uh, so we, we, we make several models in the simulation. So let's say that you demag the, 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 you demagnetize the system in the same amount in the domain and the domain wall. That all the spin, I mean, you, you, you reduce the magnetization in both at the same time, uh, simultaneously. This is a simulation which you expect, a straight line going to one. And that's not what we observe. If now you consider that something we have done a few years ago uh, at Flash, and it's a paper from Bastian Fo, uh, that you 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 have in the same time you demag the system, we we uh, we, we see a domain wall expansion, a slightly domain wall expansion, and if you do this simulation, in fact, uh, just simply you consider that as we measured before. You have a slight expansion of the domain wall in the first few picoseconds. You see that your asymmetry ratio uh, go above one, and this is typically because it's easy to understand because the asymmetry ratio just gives you the ratio between the moment, the number of moments uh, that are in the domain wall versus the moment that are in the domain. So it's it's a direct measurement of the ratio between the spin in the domain wall and the, in the in the domain, and that is something that's not upon. And then the uh, we, we, we try to modelize what happens if uh, we induce a spin torque. Because when you demag, what you, you, you send a huge power uh, infrared laser and you create a lot of hot electrons, you eject a, a lot of electrons from the Fermi level, and these electrons are spin polarized and they, 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 they travel in the, in the system. And, and, but they are spin polarized with a direction from the domain. And when they cross, 
the, the domain wall. So they, you have a, a spin in the domain which is up and is ejected and moved through the domain wall where the spin is in plane. And then you have a, what we call a, a torque. The domain walls, the spin in the domain wall, and use a torque on the on the elect, on the spin of the electrons that uh, are excluded. That's something that is known uh, from from a quite a long time uh, from a for work from uh, Michel Vera and all. And that's something we try to account. And this is uh, the red, the let's say the green curve, which is just below the red one. And perfectly, you can uh, reproduce the experimental data. Uh, including this spin torque uh, due to the hot electrons. And if you include the manual expansion at the rate, uh, you can also go a bit slightly above one if you believe that these two points uh, are real. That's basically what I say is that when, when you, you, you demag the system, you, you have hot electrons in the system that are spin polarized and they come from the domain mainly because the domain are much bigger than the domain wall and they induce a torque on the spin uh, in the domain walls. And then you see that just with a tilt angle or precession angle of the spin uh, up to eight degrees, we can reproduce the asymmetry ratio uh, that we experimentally uh, measure. So it's clearly that we show that during the first two picosecond after optical pumping, we have a change of the domain wall chirality. And we, in fact, we change from a pure nail to a transverse block nail block. And it's simply because the spin from this domain that are up travel in this direction and just a torque in this direction, but the spin that are the electrons, I mean, the spin of the electrons that are eject here from the down domain are down and they use an opposite torque. And it means that your, uh, your domain walls, in fact, as a, as a precession that are opposite in the two direction. So we have a block nail block domain walls. And that's something uh, we discover and that's something now we, we would like to, to, to study using current scattering experiments. So just, just to recall uh, briefly, and uh, now I will move to uh, the, what we are doing at the beamline and what we want to do, uh, especially in the view of study this, this clarity in the future. So the first experiment we do is uh, X-ray holography. So it's basically, it's a pioneering paper from, from Stefan Eisbitt uh, published quite a long time ago. You, you take an object, which is your sample. Let's say basically you, you let a hole in your sample, you drill a hole in a sample and you have a reference bin and the interfere at the detector position and you have another graph. Just simple mathematics makes that you can uh, uh, make a Fourier transform of your hologram intensity. And what you obtain at the end is basically three, I mean, four uh, things. The first one is a bright spot at the middle, uh, very small, which is a uh, convolution of the, the reference by itself, which you, you make the reference very small or much smaller than the, your object. In the middle also of the, of the Fourier transform, you have a, the object by itself. And you see that the size of the object is twice uh, the original size. And on the side, you have the object converted by the reference and the reference converted by the object. I mean, it's complex conjugate. And in fact, this is an image of your object uh, seen uh, with the resolution given by the size of your reference. So in practice, if you do this, uh, we can do this in uh, our, so in the first end station. So we can do this in transmission. Yeah, this is a comet end station, which is currently installed at the beam line. And I put the paper uh, from Aurea uh, that described the experimental end station. And we have also a scattering end station uh, that we try to, to do this kind of experiment, but in scattering geometry. And I will show the few results we have nowadays. So in terms of an in, in station, so we have a an station that uh, we can do for your transform holography and topography, and I will show you some example. We can have a, either we have this mask or sample approach, uh, whatever. We can tilt the sample uh, if you want to. I mean, if you put the sample uh, perpendicular to the beam, you put the out of plane uh, magnetic moment. If you tilt the sample, you can have a, a sensibility to in plane magnetic moment also. We can apply the magnetic field up to 0.9 Tesla in any direction uh, in the horizontal plane. We can cool down the sample uh, from 30K to higher than room temperature. And we have a special resolution, which is typically 20 nanometers. And uh, this is a, a view of the uh, magnet. So here it's uh, 
it's typically it's not working okay oh, it's fine it was working in the test so we we use permanent magnets that we can uh, chain the distance between the magnets uh, uh, that to chain the magnetic field and you can rotate the magnet each magnet is rotating along its direction to change the the direction of the magnetization that's something you can see that we had a, for example a system a classical system with magnetic domains when you start from saturation and you reduce the field you see the creation of domains and you can do the same for one of our sample uh, which are uh, which have a chiral uh, nail type domain and you can see that we can start we move from domain to at some field some small dots that are the, the skirions i speak uh, before and uh, so this typical uh, example from from users that come from the vinyl so the group of uh, peter art and for example it's uh, bulk materials this in done using like a uh, uh, transmission electron microscope uh, techniques this in done the bulk system and you can see that uh, other functional field we can see a nice camion uh, lattice and this is also some samples where we move depending the field from a nickel state to the schemon lattice phase and the conical phase. And this is real image using ground scattering uh, holography. This is a reconstruction from the hologram. Uh, the one I show you uh, here, it's, you see the small dot, I will show you a bit more in detail, but uh, it can be as small as uh, 20 nanometers. And you are not limited to, to magnetism. I mean, you can also, as in spectroscopy, you can also probe the metal interstate of transition, for example, because uh, in linear diacrism, you can have an access. And here is an example of uh, the phase transition in VO2 uh, done by the group of uh, Mark Golden uh, using also holography, but using linear polarization. We can do it time resolved at the beamline. So this is, a, for example, a vortex. Uh, so you have a nanostructure of uh, one micron, so few micron by few micron, stable as a Lando type uh, uh, vortex structure. You have in-plane magnetization, which are in, in this direction here, in the opposite direction, and here uh, in, uh, down and up. So you have a closed flux of the magnetization. And when you pump it with an uh, electric field, uh, you send the pulse current, and you see that you can move the vortex, uh, which is something so you have a rotation, a gyration of the vortex core, which you can follow and measure using holography. And you can also probe on the in-plane magnetization. And in fact, the in-plane magnetization, uh, uh, sorry, the out of plane, because the moment are in plane, the out of plane, if you really align the sample perpendicular to, I mean, to the beam, you see that in fact, you see a cross here, because in the domain walls between the, the, the four parts, you have an in-plane component and you see, I mean, it's hard to see, but in the supplementary materials of the paper, you see that we, we, you have a change in the color along the domain wall during the precession and that's something you can reproduce in the simulation. In fact, you have a spin wave. When you start to make the, the core processing, you create a spin wave in the domain wall that propagates uh, from the corner to up the center. And that's something we measure in this uh, time resolve uh, holography experiment. And now I will show you uh, the new development because uh, we are we are doing now. That's the main point and the drawback in the soft X-rays is the detectors. I mean, the, the, the detectors that usually people use is the CCD detectors and they have a very long reading time. It's typically in our case, we, we typically measure on about millisecond acquisition time and we have a five second reading time with the detectors. And that's something is very painful. Uh, so it's it's limit quite a lot and it's like that to make a good image from an holography experiment or opticography, I mean, you have to, to uh, let's say, accumulate during one hour, but 99% of the beam is lost just by reading the CCD. So we develop uh, new CMOS uh, detectors. So basically, we don't develop, we buy uh, a cheap uh, CMOS chip from a Chinese, directly from a Chinese company, and we adapt it to make it uh, UHV compatible. And, uh, and we modified our end station to, uh, this is a new detector chamber that in fact, in this new detector chamber, we can have uh, three detectors and we can select the one we want. So here we have the classical Princeton CCD camera. Here is a new CMOS and we have a search space for time resolve uh, delay line NCP detectors uh, for, for, for that we, we will install for time resolve experiment. So this uh, detectors has been developed in collaboration with Max4 during the Max4 Solid collaboration, the first prototype. Now, now it's uh, commercially available through the Axis uh, Photonic Company based in Montreal. So they develop and they make it a bit more professional 
uh, based on our, uh, on our design. Uh, and we fully characterize the detectors. And uh, we also show that uh, this detector can be used at uh, free electron laser, and especially at Fermi, we can pick, uh, because it's a uh, fast detector that can run up to 50 Hertz, and Fermi is running at 50 Hertz. We can use the CMOS to pick pulse by pulse the, the fail intensity. And this is a typical measurement we have done uh, to show that we can uh, reproduce the same uh, quality of data that we have in CCD with a gain of time, acquisition time, of, like, we gain a factor of 30 in terms of acquisition time. And so Fermi, when we do this test experiment, they just buy one. <laughs> now it's currently installed in the installation. We also take a, try to make a comparison the quality of the image because the CMOS and the CCD doesn't have exactly the same dynamics, the same noise, and a slightly two different detector. And this is a comparison on the same sample. So it's one of our sample with, uh, you can see this bubble-like, uh, scamion-like object. And this is a, a, a or image, this is a hologram we have, and the, the dichroic hologram, uh, you can show here, you know, you change the polarization. And this is an image reconstructed with the, with the CMOS. And this has been done in collaboration with Roberto and uh, Felix Butner from AGB. And this is the image we get from the CMOS, and this is the same image uh, we got uh, using the classical CCD detector. So basically, maybe the contrast is a bit bigger, uh, better in the CCD, but the, the main difference is that for this image, we it's a total acquisition time of 50 minutes. Not here, we have eight minutes, so we really gain a lot in in, in time. Uh, and I will show you that it could be useful for for photography. So we do the same for our sample. This is a scamion lattice measure that uh, you know multi layer. This is a scattering pattern. You see that we have a six fold symmetry characteristic from a perfect scheme, an almost perfect scheme on lattice. And we can image it as a function of field I show you. And then uh, the beauty that in fact, by carefully changing the field, we can uh, reduce the size of the scheme down to 20 nanometers, which is basically the experiment, the resolution of our experiment at the time, which means that we can stabilize magnetic object at very, with a very uh, small size, which is very important for potential for future application. That's something we are not doing time as well. So now we, I will just show you the alternative to, to not do this kind of experiment in transmission because it's very limiting the soft X-ray range because the soft X-ray is, uh, you need very thin system sample. So we try to do it in scattering geometry. So we use this uh, Yama and station at the beam line and uh, we make funny sample. So we make, uh, so we have the sample here and we put in front, uh, in top, a mask for holography. And this is a membrane where you can see that using the trick in the fib, we can uh, cut a part of the membrane. And by playing with the fib in this direction, we can move up the, mem the, the membrane, like lift up the membrane, and just playing a bit. And then we make the reference and the object all for holography. And then we put this uh, uh, mask for holography right on the sample and then we send the beam in between the two and we put the ccd detectors at 90 degrees uh, well that's i mean if i say that it sounds easy in fact it's i think we used 10 or i don't know a number of nanometers because then you have, you have to put the sample at the right position then you put the mask at the right angle and then move it down to the sample as close as possible to because your current lens is not infinite so you your mask has to be as close as possible to the sample and that's something we try and then we get a hologram in, in scattering intensity and then we try to make the reconstruction so we use a test sample which was a nano micrometer uh, magnetic dots system and this is the image we get at the end so uh, we are far from be able to do a uh, magnetic holography uh, in scattering geometry, but we are working on. And uh, uh, we also try to do, uh, I don't show you, I have no time today, but uh, we also try, to, you, we can also do it in ticography. So we just uh, have a small beam, we put a pinhole in our case, and we move the sample in front of the beam. And this is a typical uh, hologram. Uh, this is a square two by two nanometer square, a micrometer square. And you see here the vertical dots are the magnetic domains. Uh, 
So typically nowadays, we have a 50 nanometer special resolution, just limited because we have a quite a big beam. But it was using the CCD, it was taking, uh, let's say, days <laughs> for getting this image. Now with the CMOS, we can uh, expect to, to do it uh, uh, in continuous scan. And that's something now the CMOS has been installed, for example, in the stakes and, and station at Soleil. And they do quite uh, regularly typography experiments at the stakes. And uh, we will do the same uh, in the next near future. The big difference in our case is that we focus on magnetic materials and we want to keep uh, the capacity to apply uh, strong magnetic field, electric field, or uh, even do, do timers of experiments. So that's something uh, we really build a dedicated installation for magnetic materials. Uh, now, I hope that in the future of the Soleil upgrade, uh, we can uh, move to, we can gain a lot. That's my dream. And then we can move from, from doing such experiment, uh, tychography or holography in transmission. It's easy, it's easy to do, I mean, uh, quite easy to do now with the actual source, but to do it in scattering geometry that will open the way to make a uh, new experiment. And particularly, for example, in my case, I'm interested to image the magnetic clarity, not just do a magnetic scattering or secular dichroism in scattering. I just want to have an image of the clarity. And that's something you can directly do it in scattering, but you need a much higher current flux. And that's something we start to work in that. So our machine group is working for a new two meters long in vacuum upper type ondulators that we can gain a lot of uh, flux at the source and uh, so basically we can uh, with the ondulators we can uh, up to gain a factor of 10 in flux in terms of current flux at i take 800 ev we will gain a factor 100 just from the source point of view if we it will be even more easy to focus because now as i saw, show you in holography we have a let's a sample which is typically a few micrometers the field of view of samples but our beam is 50 micrometers so if we 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 can easily focus the beam uh, much easier and with a new source which means that you also gain in useful photons and we, we can also expect a factor 100 and then from the new peak new undulators uh, gain and if we change our monochromator because for for holography or for magnetic scattering uh, at transition method edge you, we don't need this 10,000 rhetoric power in practice and uh, so the idea would be that we gain basically if we do it correctly uh, five order of magnitude in uh, in current for in useful photon flux and in current photon flux and that's something for me uh, i hope that in the near future, this will open the, the, the field of uh, resonant elastic or resonant magnetic scattering tychography in a scattering geometry to, to be able to probe all the system we want with a resolution which will be in paper wavelength limited, but typically few few nano, few 10 nanometers. Uh, we are, I mean, we can also have a bulk surface sensitive just, just by changing uh, uh, the incident angle on the sample. And that's something it's really, I mean, you can have an access to all the relevant parameters for condensed matter, like the structure, if you have nanostructure of materials, the magnetic properties that I show you, electrical, like for VO2, and even the orbital ordering in the system. And that's something which is very important in scattering uh, tychography, in scattering geometry, in, in opposite, for example, to stake uh, that that we don't have any constraint around the sample. So basically you have your sample, you have your beam that is focused and your detectors, it's let's say a few tens of centimeters away uh, from the sample. This means that you can build a sample environment dedicated to what you, you want. And in our case is uh, ionic field, electric field and a pump probe experiment like in Trident or there. Right? And that's something I hope to develop uh, that we can develop if, uh, we have the money to build an upgrade of the of Soleil. That's really something uh, I hope. And I just finish uh, my talk by uh, just a short <laughs> advertisement that we are organizing a resonant elastic X-ray scattering experiment uh, end of June uh, in Paris downtown. And uh, the regist you can, uh, I mean, the registration is still open uh, until next week. So you are all uh, welcome. And just uh, I finish my presentation. Thank you so much.
uh, Nicola for this. Uh, now the session is open for questions, so please raise your hand or you can uh, type your question in the chat if you like and I can read it to Nicola. So I have a few questions about um, uh, the technical aspect. Uh, you work with a, with a cryostat. Uh, is it a, a helium flow? Yeah, it's a standard Janice cryostat. So I was, I was really curious to see how to, to know how uh, this affects stability and how stability is important for your experiment. But the, 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 the thing that for orography, the beauty is that if you have the, the uh, mask on the same sample that you, I mean, basically what we do in this kind of experiment, you have a membrane, we put the opaque layer on the side, we feed it, and then you have your sample deposited on the other side. So both the hologram, the holography mask and the sample are, uh, stick together, and your beam is bigger than, than, the, than the, I mean, the sample size, I mean, the useful sample size. So uh, even if we cool down, even if the, beam, the sample move a bit in the beam, that doesn't change anything. That, uh, that's a big advantage of holography. I mean, for, for temperature dependence or for time resolve experiment, uh, it's holography is, is really interesting. I mean, for just make an image, it's not really useful holography. I mean, you just go to a sticks and that's, that's fine. But uh, for time resolve or temperature, or I mean, or if you pump your sun system with the IA current, uh, holography is much, much, much easier. So I was actually, you, you were showing the uh, uh, comparison of the resolution that you get with the tachography. You, you're limited to 50 nanometers and uh, with, the, with the Fourier transform holography, you get down to a pixel size of 10 nanometers. So I was wondering actually if the, your limitation is not the stability rather than mm. the beam size. I mean, what do you mean by beam size intensity? Uh, the, the point that in, in our case, uh, in our case, I mean both. I mean, in our case, uh, when we do tachography, we we don't have focus element. We just put a pinhole of uh, alpha, I mean, 500 nanometers, basically, which means that we have a, a beam on the sample arriving. It is 500 nanometers plus its divergence because it's scattered from the pinhole. So we have a right, I mean, a big beam, in that sense. So the tachography doesn't make me oracle at the end. Uh, so that's the first things. And then when we do this tachography experiment, as we have a, a pinhole, a small pinhole, we lose a lot of photons. In addition to make it current, we lose a lot of photons. And then we have acquisition times that are a bit long, and then we have stability issue. <laughs> so I don't know who is the dominant one, either the beam size or the stability, but both, <laughs> I mean, most likely both of them. So we are thinking to buy a focusing element, uh, not a zone plate, because we want to to do spectroscopy, but this new um, capillary optic. So that's something we will put to recover the flux and be able to, to make image much faster. That's so much which faster. beam size are you, are you looking uh, for? I think 100, a few hundred nanometers. Okay. No more, no, I mean, because then the idea will be to have, I don't know, 100, 200 nanometers, a very clean beam, and then the tachography will uh, help you to go down special resolution because I don't want to I, again I don't want that my optical element is close to the sample I want to put it as far, as far away from the sample <laughs> yeah uh, I, I actually know that um, capillary for soft x-rays um, they're worse than specified so uh, I raise a flag here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, there is, a, there is a, a question in the chat from Richard uh, he says, I may have missed it, but when all the upgrade for the beam line could be completed and in increased flux becomes available to users. Uh, good point. The, so the new undulators, we we have built, I mean, they build, I mean, it's not me. I mean, the machine people, they build uh, the prototype nowadays, and we expect to install it in the ring before the upgrade for sure. That's the thing. So we will gain a factor of 10 in flux uh, in general or not. And the upgrade of Soleil is officially planned to be finished in 28, I think, or 26, I don't remember. But it's not yet officially financed. So it's still under discussion. So we have the scientific case down, and now we are working on the technical design uh, phase. But 
we don't have any guarantee from 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 the government that we will have the money. So... <laughs> okay, so all, all this uh, they're all they're all within a large upgrade. Of the... uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. The new beam lines, and then because then we need to make a new end station and everything would be in the in the upgrade. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand, or you can just uh, unmute and ask Nicola. Uh, hi, Nic yeah, hi, Nicola. Um, I, I have a question about the uh, metal insulator transition in uh, VO2. What, what's the nature of the contrast that you get? Is it a linear dichroism? Is it linear dichroism? Yeah. Okay. I thought it was a difference of uh, scattering amplitude due to the difference of valence electrons, maybe, or? So no, uh, linear dichroism is quite strong, so it's more easy. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Nicola, I have a I have a question about um, using this uh, imaging with X rays and uh, let's say standard more standard techniques like uh, MFM. Uh, you know, it's a bit of a silly question, but could you highlight what is the what is in your experience uh, the real gain of using X rays? That's a good point. Uh, if it's just get, uh, my, my feeling is nowadays even MFM or I mean there is a new microscope technique which is a, a NV magnetometry. When you have a resolution which is even much better than in MFM and sensibility which is completely incredible. I mean, uh, we have done an image on on the Smith ferrite, which is basically an antiferromagnetic compound, and you see the magnetization pretty well. Uh, so, if it's just getting an image of magnetic materials, I think we should stop this race. I mean, uh, it's no point uh, to make just an image. The the only advantage of its rays are that you can do it. Uh, Time resolve with high field, low temperature, and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, the, the main, still the remaining advantage of X rays is the capacity to, 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 let's say, have a perturbation of your system, whatever the perturbation is, which is quite difficult in MFM. I mean, applying strong field in MFM is not easy. <laughs> Do it time uh, temperature dependent or time resolve is impossible. So, this the sample environment or your capacity to, to perturb the system is the, is the really important one. And the time resolution is really also important. So, so, so what, are, what are the technical uh, uh, necessary uh, items, let's say technically, what does, what does a soft X-ray beamline need to be capable of doing microscopy, uh, you know, competitive, useful for material science? Um, for magnetic materials, what 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 are the ads on? What do you mean in the sense? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you know, there are many. Uh, if if I had to build up a soft X-ray microscopy uh, beamline that uh, dedicated to magnetic magnetic materials, I would certainly need the possibility of applying magnetic field, yeah. a cryostat. Um, uh, in my case, we are building, a, we are installing a laser. For uh, doing time as an experiment, uh, and you need the most highest flux you can, uh, coherent flux you can. So, which means that uh, you don't need, you need really to make a. That's a problem of all beam line that we have a branch for inelastic scattering, which is need uh, high energy resolution, which is completely useless for for, for coherent scattering. So if you want to design, you need to have a, a monochromator that just disperse uh, enough. If you can make it a long ondulator, I mean, that's something I'm start to look at. Uh, if you can make a long ondulator with a small gap, you can even think to use a direct beam, the pink beam. Does the ondulator peak can be narrow as few electron volts? And that for 3D metals, it's enough to separate the L3 and L2. And then you would gain a lot, a lot of flux. That's something we are looking. It's why it's why we are building a prototype for in vacuum long ondulators to 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 narrow the ondulator gap uh, and the, the ondulator peak, narrow it enough that it's uh, cover only one edge. And that's something. But uh, you need coherent flux as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hope also Soleil will approve. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Uh, any other questions? We have a few more minutes for questions from the audience. Question or comments? 
one other question, maybe, uh, Nicholas. Thank you. This is Richard Sandberg. Um, does the you, you mentioned some advantages of soft X-ray, but you didn't mention elemental selectivity. Isn't that another advantage? Being able to do it resonantly. Yes, but I mean, I mean, yeah, yes, for sure. Elemental selectivity is an advantage. But if you look, for example, I mean, if you do like like or semantic multi layers, you can do cobalt or cobalt iron bore or whatever. But you know how the spin relative in the system are. I mean, if you do a cobalt iron bore system, what does it mean to look at cobalt or iron? I mean, the both moments are aligned in this, I mean, <laughs> by exchange. So you don't care. I mean, in some particular compound, like uh, in ferrimagnetic materials, that it's very interesting. Yes. Thank you. Guillaume. Yeah, uh, uh, Garrett is actually with me. Hi, Garrett. <laughs> for, for you, Nicola. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe you can tell the public how you get depth information, information in the third direction. So yes. Wonderful yeah. technique. Yeah, you, you have two directions, and then you change the scattering angle, as you know. And there is something I start to, to work, I mean, to think on, is that um, in the soft X-ray range, you evaluate so curves that, uh, in fact, you should have some 3D information in the scattering pattern itself. That's something that is not, I mean, maybe Vincent can comment, but something is not account uh, in the in the software for, for optography or construction because you consider, I mean, they're coming from, from hard X-rays and your, your sphere is flat in your detectors, but it's not true anymore in the soft X-rays, which means that you, you have, even without changing the scattering angle, some 3D information already. But that's, why, why is that exactly because I'm where does that come from if it doesn't change the, the angle? Because your evasphere is curved. So it cannot be considered as flat on your detectors. Oh. So then, then you have a three information. If you are able to account that in the, in the algorithm, that's another story. <laughs> but that's... Yeah, yeah, this has been demonstrated for the structure uh, by... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, I just want to comment. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but in, in the south, Wait, what, the, yeah. the main problem is not only that you, you I mean, it's your account to the eval sphere, but uh, kinematical approximation will not work also. So uh, it's more a bit painful <laughs> to implement it. But we are working on that. I mean, we know we are almost finishing a, a dev software development in, co in collaboration with uh, Samuel Fuet from, from Santiago University. And now we are able to, to calculate fully the scattering pattern with dynamical and approximation, including roughness and default and everything. So we are on the way too, but it's a long way. <laughs> it's a long way. <laughs> okay, merci. Thanks. Uh, always in bin time, Guillaume. Sorry? You are always in bin time. <laughs> uh, not always. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I, I uh, uh, would like to stop a second just to say thank you to Nicolas and everybody who has uh, joined today to listen and to contribute. And uh, now we are free to stay here and to chat. Uh, <laughs> this is also an opportunity to, to continue uh, conversation informally. Thank you so much, everyone. So Guillaume, if you want to go back to the conversation with Nicola, you are welcome. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we're talking about anymore. That's fine. Right. <laughs> Just if you want to involve anyone, everyone. Oh, it's fine. Thank, thanks a lot. No, yeah, nice. Thank you, thank you Nicola. Yes, it was very, very, very nice. Thank you. Thanks very much. Judy, come on, un unmute yourself. You can show up. Or do you want me to read this? Do you observe the beam damage or any beam induced effect with soft X rays? Asks Yuri. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, on, on the materials we are studying, not not really beam damage, but we crack carbon at the surface of the sample. I mean, if you take the oxide, I mean, we are working. I don't show any any result, but we are working a lot on bismuth fluoride, for example. And then when you take the sample out of the beam, it's black. So you don't, I don't think we change the materials, 
but we 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 crack uh, carbon uh, on the, on the surface. That's clear. Uh, I think we are not in the limit uh, yet uh, of damaging the sample. I mean, this kind of magnetic materials. Uh, I mean, we do, do did some experiment on polymer, on, uh, on we also had some biologists that tried to come, and it was very funny. I mean, uh, we, we drill all in the, we drill all <laughs> the sample quite immediately, and that's something I see in the free electron laser. So in the free electron laser experiment that uh, I, I show you an example, uh, we spend most of the time to be really careful to not destroy the system. So basically, when we do this time resolve experiment uh, on the chirality, if you pump either by the free electron laser beam or the infrared too much, you change the roughness at the interface, and so you change the DMI interaction at the interface. And that's something we really spend a lot of time. So in the free electron laser, you definitely you can <laughs> burn the sample. In a synchrotron, I think we are a bit not yet here, I would say. Wait until the upgrade. No, that's that's something we have to and, and the focusing, you know, yeah, yeah, on yeah. the nanometer. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I was curious, I was curious to, to know. Um how can you distinguish from skirmions to magnetic bubbles or other uh, topological states with, with the 2D? <laughs> uh, so them from somewhere else? I think basically, the first thing is the size. OK. And in, in, in the, the, the magnetic bubbles that are known since a uh, long time ago, I mean, they are big. Uh, but the skirmions in your system, what the, we call it skirmions is first because it's a nail type domain wall first. And the second thing is because this, we, we can see that the size of these objects are 20 nanometers or a bit below. And that's something is not classical bubble. Also, the uh, hexagonals, like, like the short range ordering, is, is a sign of skirmions? Or... Uh, in bulk material, it's, it's known that uh, you have a six fold symmetry in, in the skirmion lattice. In the in the artificial system that the one we were studying, I mean, I show you one example when it was very uh, one of the very good sample we, we we I mean my colleague from Thales can can go. I mean, uh, most of the time we don't stabilize the scheme on that is, I mean, on, on the beam size. I mean, uh, locally you have this six fold symmetry, but on the long range usually it's not not perfect. So I show you the the, the best best result we have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the six fold symmetry is also an indication of the, of the state. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I have the feeling that the conversation is kind of calming down. Yeah. And uh, thank you again for your time and for everyone who has been here. Good Thanks. luck for your experiment, Aguillo. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dina, for organizing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining. Bye -bye. See you then.